Hi, everyone, and welcome to our roundtable discussion on DEI work. Um, I'd like to welcome you all and thank you for coming to hear from our panel of experts. And without ado, I'll let them introduce themselves. Over to you guys. Hello, everyone. I'll go ahead and go first. Uh, my name is Veronica Hawat. I'm Kenyan class of 2003. Um, I work in higher education, specifically undergraduate admissions at the University of Chicago. I've also worked in admissions at Kenyan. That was super fun. Um, in my time at the University of Chicago, I have overseen the team in our office that does the diversity, equity, and inclusion work, as well as uh, be the point person on our campus for all of the campus partners that support students' health and wellness and success once they uh, get here. So that is just my overall general. Um, Terry, I'll throw it to you next. I appreciate that. Terry West, um, class of 97. Excited to uh, spend some time with you all. I am based in Columbus, Ohio. Um, I am the DEI manager or one of the DEI managers for a company called Tech Systems. I'm an IT services company. I've been with the organization for about 25 years. Um, 20 of those years have been on the sales side. In the last four or five years, I've been doing uh, DEI work. Um, and so uh, really got into this work. I, I was had the opportunity to be in leadership um, with the organization. I went to a lot of different meetings um, across the country, and the room just started to look less and less like me. Um, like many companies, right? And so I wanted to make a different impact and a bigger impact um, than what I was making. And so um, some years back, I was able to join uh, this uh, part of the business, um, which has its own challenges, um, but uh, excited to uh, spend my time now, you know, trying to, to make an impact versus trying to uh, hit a number um, on the sales side each week. So I'm excited to uh, have a, a few minutes of your time today. And I will throw it, sorry, we'll throw it over to Jackie. Hi everyone, good afternoon. I'm Jackie Neri Arias and I use she, her, her pronouns. It's an honor to be with everyone here today, uh, virtually wherever you are in the world. Uh, I started doing this work pretty much when I was, you know, high school student, college student. Uh, I think many, many people who do DEI work really start when they're uh, you know, the personal uh, or your identity is political. So you you really, this work becomes really, really personal. So I've always been involved in some type of, you know, student group or affinity group or something along the lines that has to do with an aspect of my identity. So when I uh, when I graduated from Kenya and I realized that the, my favorite parts of, um, of, you know, the work that I had done at Kenya as a student were actually doing uh, social justice work, right? Advocating for more just policies, uh, more inclusive spaces for students of color, uh, immigrant students, international students. So I decided to pursue a career in education, but specifically in multicultural affairs. So uh, that's what I've been doing uh, my entire career, uh, essentially uh, multicultural affairs work in uh, higher education. I've worked at, uh, at you know, mostly small private colleges. I've worked at Kenyon actually for four years, and then now I'm at another uh, private college, Dominican University in the Chicagoland area. Um, but I've also done work at larger institutions uh, and then a small, a short project at a community college. So I've gotten to see, or I've gotten to, you know, learn more about uh, the needs of students uh, from historically marginalized backgrounds in different spaces, different kinds of uh, educational institutions. Uh, and, um, and actually like Terry, the, the higher I've gone up in my career, the less people look like me, right? Uh, there's lots of people that look like me in advocacy spaces and student groups, affinity groups, very few people at, uh, in, in leadership roles. Uh, so this work is really, really important to me. Uh, and I will also give a shout out to Veronica, who I remember at, when, she, when I was a student, she, was, uh, she interviewed me because she was doing her master's program. And I, one quote that she said to me really stuck to me, right? Which is, um, what, you know, I think she asked, or I asked her, why do you do this work? And she said, well, because we need people like me in this space and we need people like you in higher education, right? In positions of power, authority. Uh, so that always keeps me going, right? Even when things get tough, uh, I know that higher education needs me. So I will pass it over to Sasha now. 
Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Sasha Fanny Holston. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I'm a member of the class of 2011 from Kenyon College, and I currently am back at Kenyon College, uh, can you believe it, as the assistant director um, in the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here. Um, Jackie's actually my predecessor, so I'm really happy to um, have followed her into this role. Um, uh, so I'm originally from Akron, Ohio. I currently live in Columbus. I'm actually moving into Mount Vernon very, very soon. Um, and before I did this work, um, I should say I've always been interested in this work. I've always really believed um, in moving racial equity forward, um, especially in recent years, I've wanted to move it much, make it much more, move it much more forward than, than it had in previous you know, political cycles or just cultural touchstones. Um, but I also have a law degree, so I had to figure out how am I going to kind of integrate both of those disciplines. And this po position came up um, once I kind of realized that maybe maybe litigation was not what I wanted to do. And I and I really do believe it. Life is too short to um, not follow your dreams. So um, I'm really happy to be here and to have the opportunity to work. Um, primarily with students of color about with with anything that they need um, on campus and and just to also get to know them and be a better advocate for them. I feel like that is my main my marching orders is to be an advocate for our students. And all right, I think that's I think that is I, I am the last person. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so I guess what I'll, I'll kind of throw it to my, the other panelists. Um, in, your, um, in your work, what different elements of DEI are you uh, primarily focusing on? Um, whether that's um, retention or working with students or uh, hiring or something, things like that. Um, so uh, Terry, I will ask you. Sure. Um, you know, it's really, I mean, we, I get involved in a lot of different things, um, you know, in this role. Uh, but my primary responsibilities are the workforce, which is making sure that our offices reflect the communities that we're serving. We have about um, 100 offices in North America, and we want all of our offices to be at 50% uh, female, and we want our minority or people of color percentage to be five percentage points above the census. Um, and so I spend time, uh, I should say five percentage points above the census in that particular market, right, in that particular city. Um, so I spend time really just making sure that we've got great plans in place, um, you know, across the country. I do have other partners that report to me as well. And so we spend time there. We spend time on the workplace making sure that we have an inclusive work culture. You know, it's all about inclusion, right? You can hire diverse talent all day, but if you don't have the right environment, the right culture, um, that talent is probably not gonna stay long-term, right? And so we spend a lot of time making sure that, um, you know, we've got, you know, different venues, different programming, et cetera, to, to really drive inclusion, employee, um, employee networks, um, employee resource groups, you know, things of that nature to really help us. And then third, for me, it's um, we're a services company. And so I spend time, even though I'm not chasing a number, I'm not responsible for a number, I spend a lot of time in front of our customers, talking to them about their DEI strategy and how we can support um, them and their DEI goals, right? And, and many times that is um, through the workplace, right? And every organization right now wants to diversify their, their employees, their staff, right? And so we spend time and I spend time really talking to our customers around ways that we can do that. Um, and then internally as well, I get involved in, you know, certain things on the intranet, right? Um, being on this side of the house, right? When it's time to celebrate, you know, Women's History Month or Black History Month or, um, you know, whatever it may be, I get involved in helping write content, right? That's gonna hit the, our intranet for all of our employees to see. And so um, really neat work, right? It's really great work, it's tiring at times, but um, you know, those are some of the things that I get involved in. 
I don't know if Jackie or Veronica has anything you'd like to add. Yeah, actually, uh, similar, Terry, uh, in my role at Dominican, uh, so it, it looks a little bit different than what I did at Kenyon. Uh, at Kenyon, I did similar to, you know, actually exactly what Sasha did, right? So working a lot on uh, providing direct service to students when it comes to retention, uh, support, advocacy, uh, um, and, you know, a lot of sort of advising one-on-one -on -one with students and group advising. Uh, but then at a Dominican and more of a leadership role, I've gotten involved in some projects that I didn't even know that, you know, those were a passion of mine. Uh, but that some of the things that, you know, sort of in addition to all of the things that Terry already listed when it comes to organizing heritage months, cultural celebrations, um, crafting messages for, for staff, faculty, etc. Um, I've also gotten involved in uh, some unique projects that are more um, sort of strategic thinking and, and decision making on, on this, the message that we want to send, right, as an, as an institution to our employees and our students. So one of them that, that's really, really exciting is uh, the naming and the creation of our um, lactation room, right? So that's something that by law, uh, well, actually certain, uh, the law varies by state, but by law, we have to have uh, a lactation room, right? A, a space where uh, lactating people, right? Can actually uh, either feed their child or, um, or lactate, right? Get milk for their, get stored milk for their child. And that's something that wasn't really available before, right? Uh, so uh, from naming the space, it used to be called the mother's room and then we changed it to lactating room, um, also nursing room, but most people don't have their child to actually nurse in the space, right? During the work day, uh, thinking about what the space looks like, right? When I first started, uh, there was like not even any soap in the space, not even a space to sit. So what does a functional diversity uh, or what does functional inclusive space actually look like, right? Uh, and then some other things have been naming uh, uh, spaces, right? So a, a space for students with a disability, what, what would that space look like and what would it need? What would it be called? Uh, what, kind, what the messaging looks like? Uh, and what are the policies, uh, you know, how are the policies gonna be written and communicated to the populations that actually use the space, right? Uh, and then all the way down to my office. So my office is called the Center for Cultural Liberation which is very different and unique than most uh, diversity spaces around the world, around the country that are called like multicultural affairs or, um, you know, they, they sort of uh, have a name that maybe students didn't have a say in it. And students uh, where I work uh, you actually had the full say, right? They sort of decided that they wanted to move um, past multicultural affairs or diversity and inclusion. They wanted to call it, uh, they wanted something that had the word power in it. They wanted something that had the word liberation in it, right? They really wanted to, um, make this something that felt like their own. Um, so, so those have been some sort of interesting things that I've gotten to do uh, in, in my current role. Yeah, so, so Jackie and Sasha kind of do the work. So I, they do the work on campus with students, with partners, and there's so much of that work that is so fascinating. I do the work that leads up to that. So in undergraduate admissions, um, you typically have someone sometimes on a leadership team, I'm on a leadership like portion of our office, who thinks about diversity in the pipeline to that college or university. So there are multiple benefits to having a diverse community in a college. And how can you make sure that you are bringing in and supporting a wide variety of types of students? This, as it pertains to race and ethnicity, as it pertains to socioeconomic status, as it pertains to sex, gender, and sexuality, um, we work with a small veteran population, broadly first gen students who don't have college, her parents don't have college degrees, like really thinking broadly about diversity, how that diversity comes into your pipeline into the college, uh, how you can make the connections for those students to the great people who are doing the work on the college side. One of the only bad sides about admissions is that unless you intentionally create those relationships with students, you're kind of one and done. Like you bring in the class and you're moving on to the next class. So you forge relationships where you can, but really you're passing them to these great partners that are doing work of support of students on campus. So there's usually someone in every uh, like higher ed college admissions office that thinks about diversity, the pipeline into the college. And then uh, in many offices, that person or that team is also thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion as, in, as employment kind of standards in the Office of Admissions. So I will work with other members of our leadership team to think about training that is really relevant and helpful to our staff and how we do our work. So most admissions offices, for example, will do different kinds of implicit bias training so that what your staff has as natural biases doesn't leak into the college admissions process and how we judge students based on our own biases. So that's just one example of providing training to a staff. 
Um, like I said earlier, we do get to kind of do a little bit of work with the campus partners who do the work, but that, that part of admissions is a little tough that you just kind of, you bring great students in and then you're bringing next year's class in. So you kind of have to move on very quickly and just hand them over to your great partners. Uh, so, you know, Veronica, that kind of leads to a question that I wanted to ask the group, right, which is, um, what are some challenges that you've had in doing this work, right? And a lot of times those are the challenges, time limitations, right? So I'll just open it up to the group. Uh, what are some challenges? Yeah, I can jump in um, really quickly to start. I think the biggest one, I mean, there's always challenges, right? But uh, for me, I think many times people have great intentions. Um, it's just about prioritizing the work, right? Um, you know, in, in many facets of, of what I've seen, um, you know, in any company you work for, right? You've got your role and you've got responsibilities. And so how does, you know, DEI kind of weave into those responsibilities, right? Because a lot of the work is very intentional, right? You've got to be very intentional to make someone feel included, right? To make them feel valued, respected, welcomed, heard. And so I find that many times people want or say they want to get involved or, or want to help, right? Or want to support, but it's just not top of mind, right? Um, when they've got day jobs that they feel like, hey, it's almost like I and D is kind of over here by itself instead of realizing that it should be just a part of what you do, right? And so just trying to get people to understand that it should just be a part of your fabric. It shouldn't be like this separate thing, right? That you have to do, um, you know, some heavy lifting for. And so that's where I kind of spend my time, right? You know, everybody wants to have a diverse team or they want to have an inclusive team. They want to be an inclusive leader. Um, but it's about being intentional, um, you know, with your people as a leader to make sure that you're providing them the right support um, and the right work environment. Yeah, I, I will say there are the challenges of the individual job, the office you work in, the people you work with, like there are individual challenges, but then there are also landscape, like your profession challenges. So I would say um, in terms of individual offices, and this is very much kind of speaking to how I came into the profession, I knew I wanted higher ed, and I suspected after working as a student in Kenyon's admissions office that I wanted to do admissions. But at that time of my career, the very start of my career, I was sure I wanted to do international admissions. So that's a big portion. You're going abroad, you're recruiting all these great international students. We have a great international student population at, at Kenyon at UChicago. I was sure that's what I wanted until I was offered like my first trip to Europe to do recruitment for Kenyan in Europe. And all I could think about was how much I was going to be missing in Chicago, for example, at that same time of year, like diversity events and special CBO or school programs. Like I, I was regretting missing those events, even though I was going to be like in Norway. And I was like, no, I think this is actually the work I want. This is part of the challenge, I think, when we bring staff in, you know, we want diversity, equity, inclusion work to be something, like Terry said, something that's intentional and just shared. Like, it's just part inherent to what we all do, no matter what our role is. And I think it's very easy, like in most professions, to say, hey, person of color, you're going to do the diversity, equity, and inclusion work. And that's not what I wanted at the start of my career, or at least it's not what I thought I wanted. So making sure that everyone in an office and the profession understands like this is just inherent to our work and we should all care about it, it no matter who we are and that people who are underrepresented in their profession could get really excited about DEI work but also are allowed to do other things and grow in other ways. Um, I think that's part of like there's individual challenges but then also there's like landscape challenges in professions. So for my profession um, if anyone here has not yet heard that the Supreme Court will be hearing some challenges this year to affirmative action as it pertains especially to like at higher ed and admissions. Um, and we're having constant conversations about what does that mean? So given possible rulings, what does that mean for how colleges will have to adjust, not their goals, because the goals aren't challenged. Like you can want a diverse college student body broadly, but if you no longer have some of the same tools that you've had before to have either very race conscious or deliberate process, how does your whole process change depending on this ruling, which we've heard these rulings, I mean, 
since the 70s, there have been very high profile cases uh, against things like what we perceive as, as affirmative action. So I think there are challenges in our workplace, like that person you work for, the thing that happens, the, you know, there's the workplace in any profession. And then there's the landscape of your profession that if you're lucky enough to make it to leadership in that profession, really takes over as kind of your daily responsibilities. Like right now, my life is that Supreme Court case in some way, uh, and, and nothing has happened yet. So it's 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 both, I think, for me. Yeah, and I guess for me, um, my challenges. I think I should also note this is my first. I'm finishing my first academic year um, in the DEI space. So I've have two full challenges. I think that I'm currently dealing with um, on the macro level. I'm still kind of figuring out what higher education is all about, figuring out how to, where, where we fit in, in uh, higher education and, and wondering why aren't things moving faster than they should, moving faster um, than they should be. I think that's, for me, is a really important, um, a really important aspect of the work I do, especially when uh, coming back to Kenyon and um, reintegrating myself into Central Ohio and knowing um, that Kenyon is surrounded by a population that's not that does not reflect um, a, a majority of our the part of our student body um, and primarily the student body I work with, and I and I and I think a lot about. Um, how do we um, support those students who may have never been in a rural area um, coming into Kenyon uh, or students who have been um, surrounded by mostly minority um, populations wherever city they live in. So if they're coming to a predominantly white institution, um, how best to support them. So I'm still kind of figuring that out on the macro level. Um, and also just learning about admissions um, as, as part of my as part of my um, position, I serve on the Keep STEM Academic Committee for our uh, Keep Scholars, which are primarily first gen and um, for and uh, and uh, students of color. And so I started reading applications this year, and I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe the, just like the little things that were being, that were factored in. Um, and I also think about it from a legal spot because of, you know, cases that have come up about affirmative action and, and, um, and admissions. And, and, and it's very interesting for me. Um, and so I think this is a learning process. Um, it's better than working in a firm. So I'm much happier um, here than, um, I think it depends on the firm and it depends on the college. Let me tell you. Right, exactly. <laughs> but Kenyon, I mentioned this to someone recently when I returned um, and I had been, you know, it had been 10 years since I had graduated. My, my 10th reunion was actually virtual. Um, and the welcome back that I received um, to this campus was, was profound. Um, I was really, I was really surprised people remembered me first. And then number two, just kind of feeling that I could come back into the community and just kind of re, just resituate myself. Um, that was great. So that luckily that wasn't a challenge, but kind of on a micro level, I'm also trying to kind of minimize the amount of trauma related programming that we're doing on campus. And I see that that, um, is part of the question um, that Patrick has here um, in the chat. Um, I fully believe that um, the streaming platforms, the internet, social media, they have a wealth of information um, that is helpful to people, for, for example, um, white folks who have not, who want to learn about this work, want to learn about anti-racism. There's plenty of movies and, and documentaries and all kinds of great, great content out there um, that they can self-learn. And I, and so that means for me as a Black woman, um, daughter of an immigrant and also first gen, 
um, that minimizes how much exposure to a lot of that traumatic programming that's out there. Um, so I have been very adamant this year um, with uh, my students, particularly in our affinity groups, um, to minimize the amount of trauma um, focused programming that they're doing um, because you know life is already hard as it is <laughs> for our students and especially after uh, after COVID um, after just the disruption of their lives. Um, I try. I have been fairly successful in in making sure that we're not solely focused on trauma response, trauma focused programming, documentaries, things like that. Not, not to say that we don't do it. I mean, not to say that it's not on campus. It's just not my focus, and I don't, and I, I don't plan for it to be on my fo my focus. Um, so that's something for me that is really important, um, kind of on the macro level. Um, we have a question um, from Michael. Um, if you want to go ahead and um, speak. Uh, hold on one moment. Okay. Can, can, okay. can you hear me now? Yes, I can. <laughs> okay. Sasha, thanks very much. Um, first of all, I love the fact that we're having this conversation. As you can see from my uh, name on there, I'm um, probably one of the older folks on here with, <laughs> with the exception of, of, of Jack and Diane. Um, I wanted to let you know that, uh, you know, from the class of 70, 1976, um, during that time, uh, we didn't uh, think of this as DEI, um, but uh, certainly the issues of underrepresentation, et cetera, were uh, evident on campus. I think uh, myself being a first generation uh, Asian American, <clears throat> I can tell you that of the eight or 10 uh, Asians who were actually on campus at the time and uh, another possibly 10 to 12 African-Americans. Um, you know, the, the topics of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion um, were, you know, maybe not part of the parlance, but were certainly something that, that we were trying to address. And so the establishment of the Black Student Union, and then uh, candidly, some of the efforts that I made to, to uh, change that to a multicultural union, student union, um, were important aspects, and I think that we still continue to um, have this dialogue. And I just wanted to contribute that, um, you know, I work very, uh, very much so in the biotech and the pharma world. And in fact, next week, uh, on the 3rd of May, I will be speaking at a conference in Boston, um, specifically around the inclusion, diversity, and uh, effectively the underrepresentation of many minorities, including the BIPOC population in clinical trial development. And uh, the topic is actually something that uh, I've helped coin around the word JEDI. So it's justice, hmm. equity, diversity, and inclusion. And so we're gonna be talking about some of the issues that keep uh, many Americans uh, and globally, a lot of other people um, isolated and, and uh, not able to access uh, clinical development and have representation in the, the development of clinical data. So I applaud the effort that this, this group is making and the, the efforts that are ongoing at my alma mater at Kenyon. And uh, I uh, look forward to uh, listening more. So just wanted to jump in and contribute as I'm going to need to leave this conversation a little bit early, but thank you very much. Oh, thank you for, uh, for commenting. Thank you, Michael. I actually just wanted to quickly share that uh, my at my institution, our uh, chief diversity officer, uh, she actually uh, uh, put together a training called Jedi, and she uh, I'm going to make sure to share with her that someone from my alma mater coined that term. <laughs> well, I don't know that we coined it, but a lot of this stuff is uh, is fairly um, uh, you know serendipitous. But uh, I will tell you that it's something that I've been using, and it's something that uh, clearly rings true with. Uh, uh, the groups that we talk to. So, um, you know, you can you can talk about Jedi or you can be a Jedi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And let's see, we have another couple questions in the chat um, from Heather. 
Um, I have a question about the infrastructure that's in place for retention whenever it might fit into the conversation. So whoever wants to take that, go right ahead. Well, and I guess, Heather, maybe just to clarify, there's there's like retention as we think about it in students and education. There's re the retention and growth and development of employees in different professions. Um, just in terms of where, where, like where you're placing your question on retention, you're thinking higher ed, or are you thinking employment and professions? Yeah, of course. Um, can you all hear me okay? Yes. Sorry, it's echoey. I'm um, standing out in a hallway. Um, my specific question was about how how and what Kenyon is doing to have that infrastructure in place. Um, I am lucky in that my work, all of the policies we are working towards are generally themed around environmental justice. And we ourselves have a very well-developed um, DEI initiative and committee for our own staff. Um, and as someone who recently graduated Kenyon in 2018, it was very interesting experience for me as it was like the least diverse place I had ever lived. Um, and I have only been one place since that was as or even less diverse and that was rural Washington state. Um, and I don't know that that trend has gotten better since I left, which is disappointing because I think all students want to leave Kenyon better than they found it. Um, and I think there were struggles to establish that infrastructure while I was there. I think people could like very easily identify that lots of what kind of made up Kenyon's diversity were international students particularly that didn't need financial resources or were people who were recruited specifically to be student athletes. And then that left very few people who were not associated with the international community or with the student athlete community who came to Kenyon and were also people of color. And I think Kenyon has struggled with it. And I don't know that I've seen the infrastructure in place to retain those students and have them feel supported once they are brought to the campus. And I think that maybe talks to the disconnect between what that admissions pipeline looks like and what having students in a like, safe, productive space looks like. Um, so if anyone could answer that, I would appreciate or has any insights or follow-up questions if I need to make any part of what I said clearer. Yeah, and I will, before like the real experts address like current Kenyan or student retention, I do just wanna speak, I guess, Right, we've already heard from some others who have that perspective from the 70s, from the 90s, like to Kenyon's credit, in the 20 years since I've been a student, they've doubled the student of color numbers on campus. They, the way they provide financial aid and scholarship has been improved. The creation of retention and bridge programs like KEEP and other things. I mean, it's night and day from just when I was there. The difference you would see in four years is the difference we would see in 10 to 20 years. Um, that doesn't mean there aren't pressing issues and ways in which any college can move forward in that work. I think, so the, the one of the recent announcements, Kenyon has become like a funded partner of an organization that helps underrepresented uh, high school students, like attend colleges that fund them well, support them well. And so there's been this like great development there. Uh, and the thought is like, what comes next? So is it the expansion of programs like KEEP? Is it the addition of resources on campus? Like, I think that's an ever evolving conversation that maybe some schools like Kenyon kind of take for granted. Kenyon is nationally a school that has one of the highest retention rates in the country. Some of that is by default because of the students that come into Kenyon. So regardless of who you are, if you're going to a place like Kenyon, you're gonna retain in a higher number. That's the case for us at U Chicago too. But I guess just in, in defense of institutions, the time clock is long. I mean, change at places like Kenyon, at places like UChicago, change is long. And to the credit, like having worked, gone there, worked there twice, been affiliated as an alum, change doesn't happen as fast as we want it to. But I would say, even just in my perspective, I'm like, change has been immense. Like the difference between I, when I was a student and now being affiliated with the college. But Sasha, Jackie, I mean, any anything you want to add about like the way colleges intentionally build out retention efforts that 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 is all you yeah um i did want to mention and and i will also say from the moment that i stepped on this campus 15 years ago um to today it is a different campus now that doesn't mean it's not it's the same campus or not the same campus i feel that there are certain things that have 
um, improved for the better. Um, the way that financial aid is awarded uh, to students, um, creation like no, a no loans package that would have been really nice 15 years ago. Um, and all, but also there are things that I'm uh, that I'm seeing that I'm that I dealt with as a student that are still around. Um, the socioeconomic gap here is extremely wide. It always has been, and I feel it probably always will be. But I feel that our, there are so many different ways that we can, you know, make that equity a little bit better. Um, and we do have, you know, academic and student support funds, which is a lot of what our office does here um, in the event that any students who, who are in need of assistance with books, with um, if they have, if there's an emergency and they need to go home, or if they're, if they need um, a tire for an interview, or um, let's say they're taking graduate placement tests, and we can assist with that as well. Um, so those, those initiatives, I think, are helping to make it a little bit more equitable. I don't want to say equal. I want to say equitable. I think that's a, that's a better term. Um, but I do think that's what's that's that I think is keeping a lot of our students of color, our first gen, our low income students here. Um, I don't, you, you know, you don't, I, you don't want them, it, I don't want them to have to almost feel the same ways that I did as a student or, or, or even before then. Um, and that, and also just getting to know our students, um, our, and our, especially our KEEP students, our, 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 our first gen. Um, students as well, and we have, a, and there's a lot of them here um, that come through our office, and just getting to know them um, and as people, as students, um, does so much um, in the field of retention because they have relationships here that they will um, they, they will keep for a lifetime, and it, whether that's with our office or other other affinity groups on campus. Um, so I do think in that sense, retention is, is, is it's on, the, it's definitely an aspect of our work, like on campus today, but as opposed to, um, but in general, I think it is, those, those little initiatives are, are making a big difference. Yeah, and if I can add, I think, you know, in addition to everything that Sasha and Veronica already shared, I would say that uh, since I've started doing this work, which again is, is uh, you know, it's still relatively new. I mean, maybe 10 years, uh, uh, especially since I started attending Kenyon uh, or since I graduated from Kenyon, I mean, the institution looked completely different than when I was a student, which again, isn't that long ago, right? Um, there are just so many more students of color, so many more first generation students. Uh, and uh, the, the way that I have found is the best way to approach the work is from an asset-based perspective asset based perspective, uh, students aren't, you know, students from marginalized backgrounds aren't, aren't sitting there in their classrooms and, and, and also even staff, right? Staff of color, staff from marginalized backgrounds aren't sitting there doing their work thinking, poor me, poor me, right? I think students that, who go to Kenyan are incredibly confident, incredibly intelligent, right? And obviously we're sort of tooting our own horn here, but uh, the, the reality is that we, we have to change this mindset that students are there thinking that they're, um, somehow less than or, or somehow um, lacking, right? Uh, and we have to start celebrating the students and providing the spaces uh, that they need to be successful. So the reality is that it's institutions and workplaces that are lacking in making these spaces inclusive for them, right? And making these spaces feel uh, like, like people from marginalized backgrounds belong. Uh, so one of the ways that that I've approached that right is in addition to again you know you you do need to provide those safe spaces and those spaces to speak about trauma and heal from the trauma. Uh, you also need to recognize students right so while I was at Kenyan we started the a recognition ceremonies uh, where we celebrate all of this you know that there already existed some recognition ceremonies for a lot of like uh, fraternities and sororities and student groups but not really anything that specifically uh, celebrated social justice work and advocacy and work over an identity. So I think students really, really appreciated that. At my current institution, we um, this is the second year that we've held a Black Achievement Ceremony for our Black graduates. Uh, and you know, it, I think that that means a lot uh, for students to not only be celebrated during their one month that happens to have their, their uh, racial or ethnic identity, 
and to not only speak about their trauma, right, but to speak about the ways in which they, they are excellent, right? They're Black and excellent. They're uh, Latino and excellent, right? They're Asian and excellent. So it's not, not um, despite of, but because of their identities that, um, that we're here. And I think to provide more context, I understand things take a long time. I, I work in Congress. <laughs> this hurry up and waiting is most of my job, especially when it has to do with things like environmental justice. Um, I think my concern was more of like a, not a lack of progress that has been made from the 60s to now or the 70s to now, but but I think it's a distressing trend that I have talked about with other recent alumni and alumni from the 80s and 90s and thousands of really, really small graduating classes, um, or sorry, numbers of people of color in graduating classes. Like I believe it was the class of 2020 where just, there was not a single black man who graduated with that class. Um, and if that isn't the case, that is, I think, something the college should talk about because a lot of people, I've heard a lot of people say that and I've heard a lot of people get very angry at the progress that Kameen has made because of things like that. And I think we see this, that it keeps happening where we are doing this recruitment, but people don't want to stay at Kenyon and like rural Ohio, I see why that is not necessarily the most welcoming place at a war in the world, but also Kenyon is a private white institution. Um, and how do you make a place like that not only accessible, but a place where someone who is not from the traditional Kenyan background wants to stay, not like suffer through or like do it for the education, but a place where they want to be. Um, and I have seen what I feel like is the college putting up hurdles to that in the form of making Kenyan less accessible for students that need to work a job in order to pay their tuition with their efforts around blocking the unionization and overturning that law case and all of these other sorts of things that I feel like Kenyan has sort of regressed in the last couple of years. And I think it is having a significant impact. And I understand correlation is not necessarily causation, but it is a distressing looking trend, especially for younger alumni. And I think the students who still go there and are kind of waiting to get out because they don't feel like it is an accessible place for them. I'm trying to think of how I would respond only in the sense that I think if, if you are in the kind of the alumni or student community of folks of color or students of color or people who, who currently work with ODI um, in some way, shape or form, I think you would know that there are a lot of those um initiatives going on on campus now and they have been for quite some time i think where as an institution they're not doing the best job of is highlighting that in alumni magazines the newsletters etc 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 i think that is where the that that that's where the that's where the disconnect is um i mean I, i've also spoken you know i being able to, you know, communicate and, and have great conversations with President Decatur. And um, I know that he supports a lot of all of our, all of the initiatives that are going on on campus. I think, and I've, and I've said this before um, privately, but I think also at some point I would love to see um, alumni and parent engagement as well as our communications office um, do a better job of communicating what's actually going on on campus um, because if they don't then you know different kinds of misconceptions come out into the into the into the um, into social media or just in conversations with other alumni so um, that's something I'm thinking about uh, going forward is to really kind of uh, highlight that that work that we're doing yeah, Sasha, I, I had that uh, those same challenges when I was working there. <laughs> uh, <getting laughs> highlight the amazing work that is, is being done, right? Um, but I think you know, Heather, uh, to answer your question like very broadly, right? Um, from a from a uh, Kenyan perspective, but also in general, right? As a person doing DEI work, a person with a marginalized background or many marginalized backgrounds in 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 um, the workplace. Uh, you really have to remember that these institutions were not made for people like us, right? So it's actually a mistake to think that, you know, any any type of initiative is going to make the place completely inclusive and completely comfortable and completely um, just, right? You would, you, I, I actually, I'm a full um, 
believer in dismantling the systems, right? So many times, uh, and you know, again, you, I don't, I didn't get to do that a lot at Kenyan because of my role, but I get to do that where I am now, which is just looking at the policy and saying, we need to throw this out. There is nothing that we could do to this policy to make it better, right? We actually just need to dismantle this, abolish this and restart from scratch. Uh, and uh, I, I commend Dr. Uh, President Decatur because he actually has done that with several different programs. In fact, I just learned through Instagram, right, that uh, the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, so Sasha and uh, Chris Kennerly's office is, is essentially doubling their their uh, budget, right? And that's amazing news. I mean, that's something that that Chris has fought for since probably day one that he started at Kenyon, right? Uh, so it, it's not to sort of gloss over the many challenges, but I think it's just important to remember that in 20 years, we could be having this exact same conversation and there will still be a class that will not have any black men in it because Kenyon was not made for black men. Kenyon was not made for undocumented students, right? I was one of very few undocumented students when I went to Kenyon. And when I worked there, I thought, oh, there's gonna be so many more because DACA, because there's so many uh, programs for uh, immigrant students. And there was one that I knew of, right? That I worked with uh, very personally. So um, that's, that's the reality of our spaces um, and it's not okay. Right, we don't have to pretend like it's okay. Uh, I see Jonathan has um, his hand up, so let me uh, unmute him. So did that work? Okay, go ahead, Jonathan. Hi, thank you. My name is Jonathan. Um, so I recently graduated in twenty one, May twenty one. Uh, it's been a year now, um, and I now actually work for the Office of Alumni Engagement. And something that I did want to point out is in terms of the communication piece, it's really interesting because, you know, there's a lot of messaging from a lot of different sources, from teachers going to conferences and doing presentations, from the alumni office sending updates to alumni, from communication sending general news out into the world, from students reaching out to their alumni. And so what we're finding is that sometimes there's a little bit of a disconnect where we'll want to share and celebrate some positive news to alumni and specific alumni, but then we can't contact people who have already said, I don't wanna hear anything about Kenyan. So then that perception doesn't get challenged or for whatever reason, if you disconnect from Kenyan, there are very valid reasons to disconnect and take time and space away from Kenyan and be able to say, okay, well, that was a lot. I graduated, let me renegotiate my relationship with the college and see what it looks like in a couple of years. But if you cut off all communications from official communications from Kenyan, and then get a lot of information sources from students, from professors, from Facebook, from Instagram, then, you know, it's it just, what is your, what is the source of information? Because Kenyan, like any institution, can be very complex and has positives and negatives. So the comment that I want to say is, I think it's incredibly valuable to have alumni like you who are very willing to say, hey, I'm concerned about this. And there's an issue here because you're right. I, I think there's, space for both to exist where we criticize the college and want and expect and demand better and also recognize that the college has already made progress because inherent to the way that we've already made progress is the people that have been criticizing and demanding change. Um, so I think that this is a really good conversation so far and I want to say absolutely keep keep saying that you're concerned and absolutely keep voicing it and, and asking for ways that we can improve because that is necessary. Um, so that's my little piece. <laughs> and we did have a question in the chat, so I don't want to. I don't want to um, go to that before we get to the next question from Anthony uh, and Terry. Maybe you can speak to this uh, with our DEI activities, uh, or can we, with our DEI activities, still allow room for people of faith and other conservative groups, given that many of them don't accept some of the fundamental tenets of DEI? And if so, how? Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for this very enlightening conversation. Uh, first of all, uh, I may not look it, but I am a minority. I am Arab, and I came from the Middle East when I was 11 years old. So I am I am an immigrant. Okay, and uh, when I was at Kenyon, I graduated in 1987, and uh, the fact that there were almost no minorities there was a major problem. And I distinctly remember my French professor, Robert Goodhand, saying that that is a major problem at Kenya, uh, the lack of minority students. So I'm really, really glad that uh, we have made so much progress in incorporating uh, students from, from all diverse groups, all minorities. Yeah, but my question is a real one. Uh, you know, 
can we have a space for people who you know reject some of the tenets of dei and we all know that's that exists is there any way to sort of allow those people to be at Kenyon and other places? Or, I mean, is it a zero sum game? It's either us or them. So, so I'm sure you've all given that a lot of thought. You've, you encounter it everywhere you work. So, uh, so can we, can we have space for them? I mean, I would like to have space. I don't, I, I truly believe that we are not going to achieve racial equity until everybody is on board. And however, however that looks or, you know, let go or, you know, come along with us or we're going to drag you along with us. I mean, and that and I know that's a very radical thought in terms of how we move, how we get um, our conservative uh, brothers and sisters, our Republican brothers and sisters um, on the same page as us. Um, Kenyon has historically, again, not been very good at accommodating those um, populations. They are here. They are definitely still here. Um, again, I think we have to understand and fight how, doesn't matter how hard we think it is. And it's hard for me. It's hard for me. I'm a very, very, I, I, I lean quite a bit to the left. Um, I find it hard sometimes to want to understand why um, those populations feel the way that they do about people of color, why they feel the way they do about immigrants, about our, po our political situation. Um, I want to know why, and then I also don't want to know why, you know, for my own mental health. Um, and so I think if we come in together with mutual respect and understanding that this is, we are here as, this is a learning experience and we really, I, we're, people are genuinely curious to know, then that's great. Um, but unfortunately that is not how our political system and our, and our cultural system is at the moment. And I am honestly, as a, as a former poli sci major, I'm, I'm afraid about what's about to, what's, what could be happening in the next, six months. I, I am, I'm truly afraid. It is um, really upsetting to see a lot of um, regression in, in, in racial equity. Um, hopefully, I don't know what's going to make things change. Um, I hope it does. So that, that's just my, my take on it. Yeah. I could definitely uh, hop in just really quick. You know, obviously I can't speak for Kenyon, um, you know, not there. I would love to see those things change. I do agree with um, a lot of what, you know, Sasha just said in terms of, you know, people just having an open mind. I've had the opportunity to, you know, attend a lot of different trainings, conferences, um, you know, during my, during my time, you know, in the, uh, in the private sector, I guess I'll say it that way, right? Working for organizations and, you know, we do something here, we have what we call conversations that matter. And it's really the entire company taking a collective pause to discuss really hot topics, you know, whether it's race, whether it's gender. Um, and we put guardrails in place to make sure that people are being respectful, right? And even though you may not agree, with someone's opinion, can you at least be open to hearing to try to gain some understanding that people do have different experiences, right? And try to at least be open to listening to those experiences so you can start to gain some understanding as to potentially why they feel the way that they feel, right? Which is probably very different, right? than how you feel. And so, you know, those conversations can get really heavy, get really deep, um, you know, but I would love for Kenyon to start to try to tackle some of those things where you can bring people who have different experiences together to have, you know, respectful, right, conversations. Um, and so hopefully we can get to that point. I haven't had that conversation. Um, with anyone in Kenyan, right? But I think it's a great one to have and, and I'd be looking forward to, to doing that and supporting that, you know, any way I can. 
Um, you know, obviously in the private world, you can have those, right? I mean, when you look at, at the organization I work for, we have a lot of employee resource groups, right? So for, for you, Anthony, we have an Arab employee network, right? Um, we have a few that go down some different um, religious paths, right? For um, employees to at least feel supported. And as leaders, we can start to listen um, to some of those groups and to listen to some of their challenges and some of their experiences. So um, I'd love for that to, to dip over into, you know, more the the higher ed space. So I'm, uh, I'm definitely hopeful for that. And I think it's also really cool that Kenyon is in a unique space in allowing for like, so the potential at a college where you have a national and international student body, incredible diversity, but then also, I mean, the shock for me was less about race and ethnicity and more about socioeconomic status when I first went to Kenyon. Um, like that was huge. I had never met students who were as privileged as the students I met at Kenyon, but also I had never seen poverty the way I saw it in Knox County. It was a different kind of poverty. So I think not only that at any, almost any college of Kenyon's type, it has a very diverse student body. If we think about the national and international selection of students, socioeconomic diversity, like there's some potential there for great conversations, but also just the placement of Kenyon in Knox County, Ohio, and what that means for the type of Kenyon student who would have never met those people in their life at all. That's not the case where I work now. If I recruit a student from Chicago to you, Chicago, there's no difference in their life. But when a girl goes from Chicago to Knox County, Ohio, that's that's an immense difference. So I, I think Kenyon is also uniquely in a position where like we could be fostering like amazing conversations at the college, in the county, like in a at least historic swing state. Like there, there's immense potential there to lean into that part of Kenyon's identity. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, I think uh, I know we're coming up on time. I see you hand but I don't know that we answered Patrick's question around DEI fatigue I think he was probably the first one did we answer that I mean I touched on him but a little if you, bit if okay you all want I just to, to make sit, sure yeah. we got there yeah cool. I, it, yeah um so if we want do we have any I can uh, I can I wanted to share a little bit on the fatigue too just really quickly um, okay. So fatigue is real, right? And burnout is really real in DEI work, especially when you are a person that, again, has those marginalized backgrounds. So these, these uh, issues that you're fighting for, advocating for, uh, are like may impact you directly, right? Especially, again, in the role that I do now, I, I do serve in a lot of search committees and hiring spaces, and I work closely with the HR office. So when I'm, I'm suggesting a policy change in terms of how, how we uh, hire, uh, you know, hire like a new staff member that is uh, that has a disability or is pregnant or has, you know, it has openly shared that they have DACA, right? Something like that. Uh, um, I think like, okay, how how would this without trying without like putting my own bias in it? I think this would impact someone like me, right? Uh, so that trauma uh, that those processes can be sometimes re-traumatizing, right? And can bring up some some past um, negative experiences that I've had myself. Um, but I do think that I've, in my career, I've been much better at separating myself from the work and some of it is work and then some of it uh, is personal, right? And you, if you wanna keep doing this work and keep doing it effectively, you really have to understand what is your boundary, right? Like, what are you willing to keep fighting for and what can you tap in other folks? Uh, so I think for me, the fatigue, I deal with the fatigue by finding my people and Chris Kennerly, a former supervisor, but now a great friend is one of those people for me. Um, but also my alumni of color friends from, from Kenyan, a lot of mentoring, mentor, mentors that I um, made throughout my time there. Um, I think that's really, really important. Uh, do we, uh, I want to go ahead real quick and let Heather, if, she have, if you have a, something real quick to share before our time is up, um, go ahead, I'll mute, mute you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I will make it quick. I, to the point about how the college interacts with and communicates with alumni about the happenings on campus. I definitely agree. I think it is, there's a stage where all of the people who graduate do not want to receive a single email from Kenyon fundraising or otherwise, and then they kind of get back on the train. Um, I personally have never opted out of those emails and I have remained a class agent and I'm even like helping organize my reunion next year. 
I think my concern and what has been expressed by fellow alumni is that there are serious questions that they feel like they've asked the appropriate people and asked that it be given more attention and it hasn't been given a concrete answer directly to the person who asked and it hasn't been covered in those alumni exchanges. So like the question I had coming into this is like, how can we say we're trying to create a DEI positive space when we are, the Kenyan is actively trying to impose these restrictions that make it harder for students to advocate for better pay. And I like that affects everyone, but I can't imagine the like greater extent to which that affects students who are first generation or who come from low income backgrounds or like who need to travel a really far way to get home. And maybe their parents can't support them in that. And I haven't seen any response from the college on things like that. And I think it is those sorts of TI topics where it touches on something that's happening on campus that is like greatly exacerbated when you think about how it might impact DEI communities. And it doesn't seem like we're getting positive communication about why that is. That's like a question I haven't been able to field. And I think it affects the con like the college's fundraising and how much people want to be involved as alumni. Yeah, I mean, if you have, I mean, I think this is, it's a good, this is something that's extremely important. Um, feel free to get in contact with me um, if you want to hash that out a little bit more. Um, I'm always happy to, to give my, some of my um, opinions on, on kind of the day-to-day -day issues going on at the college um, with respect to that. Uh, so, I, so I guess at this point, we're going to uh, unfortunately uh, end this, um, which I, I would love to have had a little bit more time um, to speak to all of you and, and, and hear more, more stories and, and experiences um, about what's going on here on campus. So um, I want to go ahead and thank everybody um, for uh, coming to this. This has been really wonderful. Um, and I hope that we can do this again um, at some point in the future. Um, and uh, I hope that you all have a wonderful day and, and, to, and be well. Thank you so much. Thank you. And somebody just asked real quick, um, there will be a, a YouTube link following uh, this. Um, there will be a YouTube link following this uh, talk that um, that should be sent out.